right, everyone, welcome to worship. I'm so very glad you're here today on this decidedly grayer day than last week, but you know, it's the weather, it does what it does. <laughs> um, again, if you see this video later on uh, YouTube or Facebook, the photo behind me is taken by Erin Burden. I got it from a website called Unsplash, and it's a very lovely uh, sort of blue and purple meditation with a cross. It's very lovely. All right, let's join together in the call to worship printed in the bulletin. <clears throat> we come together to share in the great joy of praising our God. We come in response, in response to God's, to God's offer, offer to teach, teach us, us how to live, how to live within, within God's world. <clears throat> we come together to worship the God who walks with us. We come, we come in, in response, response to God's presence, presence beside, beside us, showing, showing us the way, the way to life. life. We give thanks that although we live in a world where there are many opportunities to take the easy way in life, where evil mm -hmm. takes on an attractive appearance, God has, God has blessed, blessed us to be able to, be able to, able to choose, choose to live, to live a, life a life of life based, based on, on God's, God's decrees, decrees and commands command. that give us direction for committed, for committed and, fruitful living. and fruitful living. Let us pray together. We gather before, before, before you, Lord. We join, we join together, together to praise, praise your, name name your name and give thanks, and thanks for your mercy. Thanks for your mercy. We come, we come to, learn to, to learn to live, to live in, in peace with your world, world with your world and one another. Give us, give us your blessings. Your blessings. We pray. We pray. That as but we, as we, we see, see, no, no door will, will, will cross for us, we may live we may lives, 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 lives that reflect, that reflect, that reflect the glory of, of, your your son, son, Jesus. of your Son, Jesus, the Christ. The Christ. Amen. Amen. All right. Our first hymn. In the cross of Christ, I glory. Wait, it's coming up.
<clears throat> Even as we stumble on the way, God watches over us and calls us to confess and welcomes us into the embracing arms of mercy and healing. Let us pray, saying, Merciful God, forgive us for the times when we look to you solely to justify our lives. Forgive us when our confession does not offer you the truth that you already know. Open our ears to hear your words of guidance and correction. Give us trusting hearts that know your discipline comes from a deep love that will not allow us to be less than what you intend for us. Lord, give us courage to see ourselves through your eye. Make us new people. Our God knows good from evil and will judge our hearts and minds righteously. For our sakes, the Son of Man is betrayed, killed, and rises again. I declare to you in the name of Jesus Christ, you are forgiven. Thanks be to God. If you will join me then in the uh, prayer for illumination that is printed in the bulletin. Let us pray together. Gracious God, our way in the wilderness, guide us by your word through these 40 days and minister to us with your Holy Spirit so that we may re reformed, restored, and renewed. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. All righty. Uh, the scripture reading, we're sticking in Mark, and it might sound familiar again. Uh, it's another story of Jesus predicting what is waiting for him in Jerusalem. This is Mark chapter 9, verses 30 through 32. I'll be reading this from the New Revised Standard Version. Jesus again foretells his death and resurrection. They went on from there and passed through Galilee. He did not want anyone to know it, for he was teaching his disciples, saying to them, the son of man is to be betrayed into human hands and they will kill him. And three days after being killed, he will rise again. But they did not understand what he was saying and were afraid to ask him. This is the word of the Lord, and thanks be to God. In Mark's gospel, Jesus predicts his death three times. We looked at the first prediction last week uh, that followed right on the heels of Peter's confession that Jesus was the Messiah, the one they had been waiting for. Now remember, Peter took a serious step forward by saying this out loud and to Jesus' face. Other people heard him, and he risked having the wrong people hear him. But rather than celebrate this 
big step, this risky proclamation, this revelation that Peter and the disciples and the people around them had been waiting for generations to experience, Jesus then began talking about suffering, being tested and found inadequate, being rejected and put to death. Peter attempted to get Jesus back on their track. He had moved from faith to certainty. And in the process, he became a tempter and an obstacle to God's work. Peter, James, and John then went up the mountain with Jesus, witnessed his transfiguration and the appearance of Elijah and Moses. And then they returned with Jesus to the lowlands. Jesus rebuked an unclean spirit, which is what happened just before these verses. And then once again, predicts what is waiting for him. Betrayal. Wait, what? Now, when we hear the word betrayal, when Jesus speaks of the betrayal that is awaiting him, we probably all think of Judas, right? That one guy, the disciple who handed Jesus over under the cover of night. And we might wonder why he did it. Did he do it for the money? 30 pieces of silver, hmm, that's quite a bit of, that's a, that's a big chunk of change in those days and today. Well, maybe he did it for the money, although Matthew in the story of Judas says that he tried to give it back after Jesus was arrested and condemned. He didn't want it, according to Matthew. Many other biblical scholars through the centuries have, have uh, have um, interpreted Judas' betrayal as an attempt to force Jesus, the Messiah, to take a stand against Rome. Be the Messiah that we expected you to be. And you know, he wasn't doing it. And so uh, Judas decided, well, I don't know how I'll get him to do it. It's sort of like having a friend who's standing on the top of a high rise uh, a diving board at the swimming pool who's frozen up. And so the best option, of course, is to run up behind him and push him. Not really. But that's essentially what Judas did with Jesus. Judas perceived Jesus as being frozen up, not going down the path that Judas and maybe some of the other disciples wanted him to. He wanted them to act. And so Judas forced his hand. That is much more likely. And it reveals that Judas never really understood what Jesus was doing. Now, lest we point and wag our fingers at Judas too much, we need to ask ourselves, do we always understand what Jesus is doing? Do we understand what he means when he says he's going to be betrayed? Well, now we all know what betrayal is. We know what it feels like. It makes you feel like you're losing your mind when you find out that someone close to you has done something deliberately to damage your relationship. It puts you on an emotional roller coaster and it pulls and throws you around until you're begging for mercy. It yanks your sense of security right out from underneath you and puts you in a state of emotional freefall because if that can happen, what else can or has happened? It's emotionally distressing, severely. Wait, what? So we know the experience, the emotional experience of betrayal. But did you know your brain responds to it as well? The fear center in your brain, that fight or flight uh, spot down there on the, on the lizard brain, it fires up and it stays fired up and it creates hypervigilance, a restlessness, anxiety, and a sense of being perpetually on guard. Because like I said, if it happened once, it can happen again. This alters your ability to regulate your mood, to calm yourself, think, to reason, and to make intelligent decisions. You're just running on adrenaline. And if you've ever seen a toddler who's been given too much sugar, you know that there's a crash coming. It's very much like that. You're just on, you're on, you're on. 
your fear center hijacks your normal functioning and you find yourself in a world where every task feels challenging. Your mind will not stop racing, your emotions feel out of control, and your coping skills are stretched to the limit, if not actually at this point non-existent. I'm sure we have all felt that to some degree or another in our lifetimes. We may have seen it in this past year particularly as political divisions have arisen among us over things as simple as wearing a mask or watching a family member get lost in addiction. You know what they need to do. They know they know what they need to do. And when you find out they've been lying to you, there you go again. We're back in the cycle one more time. Or watching someone that you know and love descend into a cult. Uh, buying crazy ideas as absolute truth. There are many surprising ways we have discovered one another just this past year and in the past couple of years. You really think that? Wait, what? Now this is all very interesting and relatable about the relational and physical responses to betrayal that we feel when we are betrayed. But in these verses, Jesus is the one who is going to be betrayed. That shifts the focus a bit. David is preaching on uh, this similar topic, the topic of betrayal. He's using some different scripture passages today. But we were talking about it, and we were talking about what it is to betray God and uh, what it means for Jesus to have been betrayed. Why? Why was it? Why was he says it three different times in Mark's gospel that he's going to be handed over, he's going to be betrayed. Something is going to happen that is going to show God in the person of Jesus that humans once more cannot be trusted. And think of it, this is not the first time that God will be betrayed by human beings. The very first time, the garden, the garden of Eden. And the way that God is betrayed by humanity there is a creature comes into the garden and plants a seed of doubt in the woman's head. And she shares that seed of doubt with the man and the two of them together discover that, hey, God hasn't been telling us everything. This guy says so. And so, uh, being deliberately kept in the dark, they think, they betray God's trust. And so God shows up in the garden, discovers it, and says, what have you done? And then later, as the people have been rescued from slavery in Egypt and they go into the wilderness to be led home by Moses and Moses goes up onto the mountain to receive the law of God and the people get freaked out because he's been gone so long. Is he ever going to return? Oh my gosh, we had it so much better in Egypt in the past. And so we make idols and we forsake God's providence and God returns and says, what have you done? And now Jesus is facing the cross. The cross, where God took all of the betrayal of all time and concentrated it in that one moment that Jesus shouldered all the betrayal of human beings everywhere, every time. The betrayal of the garden the idolatry of the golden calf, the greed of Israel's kings who forgot their sheep, the people who in fear forget their God, all betrayal from every time and every place on Jesus' shoulders on the cross, no wonder he died.
but here's something. From the perspective of eternity, God has already handled our betrayal. All our betrayal. The betrayal that has happened in the past, the storied past, the recent past, just last week. The betrayal that we will do in the future, maybe unwittingly, maybe deliberately. We lack the perspective of eternity. And so it isn't always clear to us that what separates us in the ways that we betray God are onerous to us and only us. In going to the cross, Jesus shows us that God has dealt with our betrayal. Through the grave, sin is repaid and the sinner is redeemed. The flip side of betrayal in this story is hope. Jesus hope that in going to the cross, in being betrayed, handed over, heading up the, the hill to Golgotha, he will upend, eliminate the seemingly unending cycle of betrayal. Wait, what? Really? That is good news. Indeed. So whatever experience of betrayal you have ever had, betrayal that you have experienced, betrayal that you have inflicted on someone else, you may still bear within you the scars of that. There may be some echoes of that from time to time, but know this beyond a shadow of a doubt, God has dealt with it. God has handled it. Jesus took it on himself into, on the cross into the tomb and left it there when he was raised. I'm going to say it one more time. The sin is repaid and the sinner is redeemed. Good news. Hopeful news. Maybe something that can get us through this week. <laughs> Thanks be to God for the gift we have been given in Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. Amen. All right, now we're going to sing in the cross of Christ I glory. Here we go.
the prayers, the morning prayers for today, whew, the morn, uh, are written by uh, Reverend Nathan Williams, who at least three years ago uh, was the pastor at Echo Hill Presbyterian Church in Cedar Rapids, Iowa. So I'm borrowing heavily from him today. So let us approach God's throne of grace, breathing in, breathing out, hearing the words of the Spirit. In this season of repentance and healing, we accept God's invitation to be ever mindful of the needs of others, offering our prayers on behalf of God's community in the church and in the world. So let us pray to the Lord of all. O oh Lord, you bind us together as brothers and sisters, beloved in Christ, Jesus' body on this earth. Fill our hearts, our lives, our voices with your praise and make us bold to proclaim your name to all people. We lift up those close to us who face trouble, especially those who are sick, who are sorrowing, who are confused. We pray for those we know who are facing chronic illness we pray for their family members as they minister to them and as they witness their suffering. Gracious God, we know people who live deep in our hearts who are experiencing sorrow and grief. And so we lift them up to you. We pray that your presence will surround them. That they will know they are loved and seen and remembered. We pray for those who were ill. We pray that you will be with their spirits. You will strengthen them, give them courage for their treatment, give them good hope that science, technology, medicine will be their partner. And we pray for those who are caring for them, nurses, technicians, doctors, their families. We pray for those who are poor, those who are hungry, those who are homeless, who are all closer to us than many of us realize. Open our hands to share what we have and open our hearts to share the relationship we have with you. Lord, your son told us that we don't live by bread alone, but by every word that comes out of your mouth. And so we pray that as we do what we can to alleviate hunger, we will also feed people with the witness of your son, Jesus Christ, who motivates us to share our bread. And we pray for the people who have no shelter. We pray for the people who are doing what they can to help people find shelter. This past year has shown us how very many people live in the cracks and how very many people fall through them. This pandemic, this virus, this time of being sheltering in place has shown us just how fragile our connections are and how very on the edge so many live every day. We have no excuse for not knowing. 
And the only excuse we have for not participating in alleviating that is that we just choose not to. And so open us, gracious God. Pour your abundance into us. Make it burst out of us so that it may flow to other people. The real trickle-down economy. We pray for those who are entrusted with power over nations, corporations, and the authority of the world. That the decisions they make will honor you and seek the welfare of the people to whom they are entrusted. We continue to pray for our country, gracious God. For leadership that is attempting to make a difference. For leadership that is doing all it can to keep others from making a difference. We have brought this on ourselves, this division, in choosing to look at a political opponent as an enemy rather than someone who just has a different viewpoint and a different methodology. Lord, give us wisdom, reason, and strength of character to see that someone who is on the opposite side of an issue is not an enemy and that you stand with them, that any line we draw in the sand automatically means you're there too. We don't own you. And so even though we may feel our cause is just, help us understand where other people are. It's the only way we're gonna get through it. And Lord, we pray for all the generations, those who have come before us, who have taught us the faith, who have taught us how to trust, who have taught us how to give, who have taught us how to laugh and sing songs of praises. And we pray with hope for those who were coming after us, the good news of children coming into this world, of children who are already here, who we teach to proclaim your good news. Lord God, keep us faithful. Keep us faithful and help us trust you. Hear now these, the deep prayers of our hearts as we open them to you and lift them up so that you may know our hearts, our minds, our hopes, our fears. Lord, hear these, our silent prayers.
grant Almighty God that the prayers we offer to you today may be your channel in us for new and abundant life. Not only abundant life that we hope for, but abundant life that we welcome and work for through faithful word and faithful deeds. Hear these our prayers, almighty God, and give us the faith to know you've already answered them. Give us eyes to perceive how you have responded. We pray all of these things through the name of your Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ, who taught his disciples to say this prayer together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. The memory of Jesus' sacrifice calls us to open our hearts and hands and to embrace God's world as we offer our gifts. May our lives invested through these offerings create a new reality and extend the grace of heaven. May we be blessed to be a blessing. Friends, I say it every week, find a way this week to give. It could be something big. It could be a huge, grand gesture, a large check with a lot of zeros behind it. Or it could be something as simple as a smile, a wave to a neighbor, to somebody on the road. Make sure you use all your fingers when you do that. But through the generosity that God pours into you, find a way to give. Be in prayer about it. Who needs help? What can you do? And be aware of the movement of the spirit in a spontaneous moment. Friends, give. Because God gave to us. So let us dedicate the ways that we have given and the ways that we will give by singing together the doxology and then praying the prayer of dedication. First, the doxology. Let us pray together. God of all, we humble ourselves as we offer our lives, our hearts, and our gifts. In putting others first, may they discover the wonders of your kingdom of grace and hope. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Our final hymn is Let Us Be Joyful. And I realized um, when I went looking for a recording of that, that I couldn't find it the last time we sang it. So David said, hey, well, why don't you use this fun little computer application and, um, and record it yourself? So I did. Um, so I have an actual piano version of Let Us Be Joyful. Let's hope it works. It's uh, number 208, if you've got your hymnal in front of you. Here we go.
and it went kind of fast. <laughs> and now my friends, go out into this world as you are able in peace. Have courage, hold on to what's good. Return no one evil for evil, but strengthen the faint-hearted. Support the weak, help the suffering, honor all people, love and serve the Lord, rejoicing in the power of the Holy Spirit to do those things and so very much more. And now may the love of the God who created you, the peace of the God who redeemed you, and the strength of the God who sustained you, with you now, this day, and always. Go with God, my friends. Go in peace. Amen. Please greet one another with the words of the ancient church. The peace of the Lord Jesus Christ be with you. And also with you. Yes. <laughs>